I'm Jenna Siri, a bookseller and associate producer of Poured Over, and today I am so excited to be joined by Julie Meyerson, who is the author of something like 11 novels, nonfiction work. She's a critic. She's been all over in the literary world, and so I am very excited to talk to her today. You may have remembered some of her previous books, like one of my favorites, Something Might Happen, but today she's with us to talk about her return to fiction with nonfiction. And I can't wait to talk about this great book. So thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. It's great to be doing this. So usually I like to start with the author setting up the book a little bit for our listeners, since they may not have had a chance to read it yet. And usually you can do a better job of giving us sort of the elevator pitch than I can. So if you would want to start with setting up nonfiction for us. Okay. Now, I was worried you might ask me that. And actually... <laughs> Although I've seen other authors do that really well, I, I feel I'm very bad at this. And it's partly, I have a feeling it's partly because when I write my books, I don't know what they are. So I never ever sort of do that thing with myself of saying this is about X, Y, or Z. And even when they're finished sometimes, it, it takes the readers or the critics to say this is what it's about. And I sort of think, oh, okay, it is. So, but I mean, the best I can do, having said that, I suppose it's about a middle-aged couple dealing with the tragedy of their daughter's drug addiction. It has a few other strands. There's a there's a, a love affair in it, or love affair or not perhaps so love, depending on how you look at it. But I think really, and this is another reason perhaps why this one is particularly difficult to describe, I think it's a book about writing. So all those strands, they're not quite traditional plot in the sense that they might normally be, because it's really a book about can you trust the narrator of a novel or the, indeed the narrator of her life? Can you trust writers with anything, in fact? So, and so it's quite a twisty book in that sense. I'm not sure... I always feel in a way just to describe it as it's not really just a book about addiction at all, although that is the driving force in it, or perhaps the driving emotional force. Now you see, I didn't do a very good job. Today. No, I think that <laughs> makes perfect sense. Because like you said, there is so many interwoven pieces in this novel. And mm -hmm. I think everyone will come to maybe a certain piece of it first. Some people may yeah, I think that's true. really connect with the piece about writing or the family, the marriage, yeah. the um, motherhood is such an important piece as well. Yes, I didn't even mention that. Yes. I think everyone will find what they need to find from it in, a, yeah. in the order that works best for them. It's interesting that you say motherhood because many, many people, readers have said to me, I love that this is a book about motherhood. And weirdly, that didn't once occur to me while writing it. I mean, obviously it's true, but anyway, it, it just didn't. I think that that goes too to the way people read that like, there's always yeah. going to be another layer. I hear that so often from authors that, you know, there's readers find these layers in books that, they do. that the author didn't even connect on their own. Yeah. It's what's wonderful about reading and writing. Yeah. It's so it's, it creates such a better experience, I think, as a reader to be able to sort of wade through these layers on your own and come to the conclusions. It's very fun. But I was wondering yeah. as I was reading, since this is such a huge book in the terms of sort of the emotional expanse that it covers, how you came to deciding that this was the story you wanted to tell now? Yeah, you see, that's the problem. Um, I, I know I sound very slippery when I say this. I never decided to tell that story. I wrote this book, part of the reason why it did take me a long time, because I think I was, with all my books, it's the same. I don't set out to write a certain book. I write and see what comes, and then I edit ferociously and see where it's taking me, see if I'm excited by where it's taking me see if where it's taking me feels honest. I mean, literally all my books, including something might happen, were written like this, which is why I don't sort of know what I'm writing about. But with this one, I kept making false starts. And I it had so many incarnations, which I would be too embarrassed to show anyone. I mean, literally no one has seen them. And, but, but actually looking back, it was my way of finding my way to this. And the moment I knew that I had written, funnily enough, I wrote a beginning. Finally, I wrote a beginning, which is the beginning of the book, which is about the parents locking their daughter in the house. And the moment I wrote those first opening paragraphs, although I did work on those paragraphs, I mean, I, everything I write, I work on massively. I knew when I wrote those paragraphs about there came a night when we had to lock you in the house. I mean, I'm paraphrasing here that I thought, yes, that's we, OK. I can now go somewhere. But that still wasn't sort of deciding what it was going to be about. It was clear that I was writing about a drug addicted child, which is something I do have some experience of. But I still didn't know what the book was going to be. So I, I have to say, I know it's a difficult it's not a very good answer, but I just, I never decided. And then I saw where it took me and that felt exciting, actually. And I never intended to write about writing either. In fact, that's something I've always slightly resisted because I sort of feel, 
proper jobs are more interesting than writing writers writing. And I usually give my characters actual jobs if I can. But it, I, I just knew it had to be about writing as well. It became a book about writing. I think that it's a better answer than you may think, because you can almost sort of feel that in the book, this unfolding and unraveling as you go that. Oh, yeah, I like that. Yeah. When you start with those great opening paragraphs that sort of drop you in to this world that you are very quickly have to sort of put your feet under you and make sense of it. Yep. As you go through, it all opens up in front of you, which is kind of what it sounds like you're saying is that oh, as you kind great. of, yes. it sort of mirrors that experience as you're reading. Yeah. Actually, unfolding, I really like unfolding because it did feel like there were all these folds which were dark, you know, not opened, even to me. And I do always feel when I write a book, actually, again, I don't know how this comes over when I say this, but I always feel the book I'm writing does actually already exist. A bit the way when a sculptor's sculpting away stone, there is, I feel there is a sculpture in there. You've got to find it. And it's, I never feel like I'm creating it from scratch. I feel what I'm doing, my job is finding it. And that's what it feels like. The unf- And I did like the way it does unfold this book. I would like to think it does. But those folds were not revealed to me, even when I was writing it in some ways, if that makes sense. And I think maybe this will be another question that you'll you'll be like, I don't know how to answer, but I have to ask because Sorry. the voice yeah. is so strong in this book. Our narrator's voice, that's what leads us through this entire journey. And whether we feel like we can trust what she says or that what she says is, you know, actually as it happened or the emotions that all come with it, her voice is pretty stunning. When I open a book, that's the first thing I'm looking for is can I fall into this voice of whoever is leading me on this journey? And I don't have to, I guess, like them. I don't have to agree with all the choices they make, but I want to be able to say, okay, I know you're going to take me somewhere. How does that feel to develop that kind of voice as you write? You're right. That's exactly what I want as a reader. I don't have to like the person. I don't have to know what the book's about. I don't even have to understand what's being said. I have to believe that there is absolute authority here, that there's a narrator who is going to take me somewhere, which may make me uncomfortable, but a place I'm happy to be taken to. And I suppose, so therefore, as a writer, that's exactly what I try to do, just because those are the books I love. And how to develop the voice. I mean, everything I write, Trying not to back the question away this time. <laughs> Everything I write is sort of done instinctively. So I literally, I write a sentence and I write another one. And if the second one feels like the right next sentence, I go with it. If it doesn't, if it feels fake or phony or not where I want to go, I get rid of it. And because I'm a very good editor of myself in that sense, actually. I'm, in that sense, I'm never stuck as a writer because I can always write what I can't, but I have to get, I get rid of so much. But the, the way the voice develops, I suppose, is simply that I listen. Even this morning, actually, I'm writing a new novel and I, re- I noticed I was concentrating, which means listening so hard to how the words are coming over and whether the, the effect is the one I want. And I suppose so that's how I develop a voice. And I mean, I suppose I was a bit I think people sort of assume people have assumed partly because of the tease of the title that this voice has to be me, that this is me. And actually it isn't. Um, it's sort of what the furthest from myself that I've written, I feel, for a long time. I can see, I mean, I do want readers to wonder if it's me, but it actually isn't in many ways. So, so yeah, but it just, the voice comes. The, and like everything I write, it's actually about the words. If the words are put down right, the voice will develop. I don't actually think about voice in that sense, in a way. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I think that translates because you have these beautiful sentences that you create. And there's this world that sort of opens as we go through, as we sort of understand, as we get these little details, what what the narrator chooses to give us and what we, you know, can piece together of like sort of the connective tissue that's missing between a lot of these scenes and that we have to fill in ourselves. And yet, I want to talk about writing complicated women because it's something that I think that you come back to often in your fiction is these do, complicated it's women. True. And yeah, that's true. they are, I don't like the term likable or unlikable. I think when it comes to, especially mm. female characters, because I think it's so often pointed in a way that is yeah. really unkind to women exactly. because I don't have to like or agree or understand why someone makes their choices. But like you said, I need to have that authority of why. And I think so often in your novels, you have these women that make choices that I think a lot of people would say are outlandish or, you know, that we wouldn't agree with. And yet, 
we're always right there with these women as they're making those choices. Yeah, I suppose I am. It's like, you're right, they are complicated women. And I don't like likable or unlikable either. That's a, It's a lazy term, actually, I think. And what these are are people um, with strong passions, strong feelings. And I think I love writing about motherhood. I mean, although I say I didn't know I was writing about it here, I think perhaps the reason I didn't know that is because I always, I so often to some extent write about motherhood. I mean, my, my first novel, Sleepwalking, was actually about motherhood. Having children and being a mother is one of the strongest emotions and passions I've ever felt in my life. And I don't think those come without complications ever. And I think I consider it a real challenge to write about those things as they really are. And similarly, you know, love and sex and sexual relationships between men and women, I find them fascinating. Again, I think the challenge as a writer, what I want to do is write about them without sentimentality, without glamorizing them. I don't think that makes them unattractive, or to me it doesn't. It makes them honest and true. But yes, do the people in my novels always do the kind of things that people would approve of? No, I don't think they do. But that's not the point. And it's certainly, again, not what I read book novels for. I think novels, when, when you read a good novel, it wants to be about, you want to see real human beings being presented with choices. Not even necessarily moral ones, just choices about their lives. What do they want? What do they feel? Where would they like to go? You know, and that, that's what I'm trying to write about. Actually, I'd love to write about men. And I have tried slightly in some of my novels to write about men. It's more difficult. But, you know, I'm not actually just trying to write about women. I'm interested in men and women, actually. I'm certainly interested in them together as well. I definitely, as I was reading, found myself just returning to the character of the narrator's mother, who is just this incredibly complicated and often infuriating presence in the book. And yet there you give her so many moments of humanity and so many moments of allowing us to understand this person who is maybe making a lot of choices that most of us would bulk at a little bit, but at the same time, you get you manage to still give yeah. her so many moments where I was like, oh, I, I get that feeling. Well, I'm glad you say that. You know, it's funny, actually, this book, although it's called nonfiction, it is entirely fiction, except for one character. And the character of the mother is the only one who is based completely on my own mother, who actually have very sadly died while I was writing this book. So and I don't know what I'd have done if she hadn't died. I had a very difficult relationship with her, as you can tell from reading the novel. And I was estranged from her, actually, when she died, which is still something I'm processing in a way. And I think this book, I was already writing about her when she died. It became part of my processing of the loss of her because it probably comes over in the book. I hope it does. You know, I was she had a very, very strong influence on my life, but it was a very difficult relationship. And it is one I'm still slightly trying to recover from. But, you know, I absolutely feel she had an incredibly difficult childhood. She really was sent away to boarding school when she was five years old on an aeroplane. I mean, unthinkable. She had very difficult, strange parents. And I think she was all her life, and I think I say this in the book, she was looking not just for love, but she was looking for recognition. She wanted to say to everyone, here I am. And that's why she was she was very competitive with me in not good ways. But yeah, I was trying very hard. I'm glad you say humanity, because I would hope. People have said when they read the book, oh, the mother's a monster. And that gives me a bit of pain because actually she's my mum and I didn't really want her to come over a month as a monster. I think she does some quite monstrous things in the book and, and indeed she did in real life, but she isn't, she wasn't a monster and I loved her very much and I, and I do have very strong feelings about her and I still feel her loss. And the bit, there's a little bit about her grave and because I wasn't, I was banned from going to her funeral. It was all pretty awful, like in the book, but her grave, when I visited it, I still do think about it. There's a bit in the book where the narrator says she still wonders what the weather is, where the grave is. And that is absolutely true. So all the writing about the mother actually is real for me. That's not true of everything else. But That piece about the weather uh, really stuck with me because I'm the kind of person where, you know, I have friends who live all over the country, all over the world, and I'll keep the weather in my phone for wherever they are. So just, so. just in case uh, so I can know. It's a way of being closer to people, isn't yeah. it? It's cut somehow. So, yeah, I do that with all my kids as well. And I think I remember, I actually remember writing that bit about the weather and it's funny and it was very close to the time that she died and it was literally something I'd just been doing that morning, checking the weather on my phone where her grave was and I just put it straight in the book. And so it's very much from the heart and very true that bit. You know, whereas actually a lot of the book isn't, my, you know, the husband is not my husband. He's nothing like, my husband's nothing like that. And so, yeah, there's a huge amount of fiction in the book, obviously. I think something that goes along with those pieces, like you were saying, you are interested in writing these relationships is like your work and especially in nonfiction really shows sort of these like magnetic influences that we have on the lives of others. There's so much about how mm -hmm. one change in a relationship can cause sort of these huge shifts in 
everyone's lives. Our narrator, when she meets this person from the past, or in Something Might Happen, Tess and Lacey, this, these huge moments yes, where it's very like that. Yeah. something, you meet one person, one sh- thing change, and it sets off this, you know, entirely mm-hmm. different course of your life. I think, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in the, you know, obviously, when you're a mother, you you become responsible for individuals who are growing up. And I think there's a huge, a huge expectation of mothers, more than fathers, actually. And I'm not meaning to be sexist when I say that, but I think it is more than fathers to be the steady thing for them, the person who puts them their needs first. And indeed you do when you have small children, it's absolutely instinctive. It's impossible to imagine anything else. But children grow up and you you remain a woman. And I think I'm very interested in that sort of that tug about what you're saying to yourself, well, who am I still? And other things come along. And that's what's happening in this book. You know, she's gone through a very difficult time. They're going through, well, actually, no, the child is young at the time. The funny thing is actually in this book, that the affair, I mean, I hope this comes across, it doesn't necessarily happen. It's certainly something she's writing about in the way it's something I've written about. I've written about, as you say, with Tess and Lacey, I've written fictional affairs like that often. In this book, I want to encourage you to think it may be true. And indeed, I'm not sure whether it's real or not. But yes, it's sort of, again, going around. In, it's very hard to describe, isn't it? But going around in circles, inviting the reader to imagine that this is really happening and then to imagine she's written about it. But even so, the impulse is the same. What do you do if you're a mother? And you actually, someone speaks to you and sees you as you want to be seen, um, even if it is a sort of married narcissist. <laughs> Still, you know, how does that feel? We all try to forge out paths for ourselves. I'm interested, and actually it's not really, I don't know what I think about any of that. What I'm interested in is the dilemmas it throws up, the drama it throws up, and I find that really interesting. And parents, you know, I love also parents are complicated, not especially well-behaved human beings sometimes. I don't think that makes them any lesser, actually. I think so many of your characters have that, where it's like you show all sides of them, especially the sides of people that I think they try very hard to cover up or to maneuver out of the light and you say nope here it is this is the full spectrum of humanity here yes yeah I hope I don't judge them too hard for it in the novels I don't think I do although my husband has a joke that my husband who I've been with for a very long time I should say right from before the first novel has a joke that the man in the novel for a while the husbands were always being murdered hit over the head with a paperweight as in Laura Blundy or something he said the husbands were having a really hard time but the husband, actually, the husbands have almost never been based on him. I think once or twice I have used him a bit. You're like, don't read too much into it. It will be fine. I think something that, you know, is important also to talk about in this, in, especially in this book, is that the amount of detail you give us, the amount of detail you don't give us, and what we're meant to do with what's in between. I mean, I found yeah. really striking in this that uh, no characters have names. You're, you really are having to do a lot to yeah. sort of piece together relationships from these snippets, there's so many details that are sort of left out. You're playing with time in a really interesting way. You're making us do a little bit of work on this one in a fun way. Yeah. Well, again, I like, as a reader, I like to be made to do work. There's nothing, you know, I think as a reader, the gaps, the subtext, the gaps between what you're told are, are what's really fascinating. And I also think in a weird way, I'm not saying this about my own work, but I think what marks out a really great piece of literature is it's a book that you can read one day and then come back to it in 20 years time and it will feel like a slightly different book because you're in a different place that's not true of sort of you know a detective novel necessarily but it is true of a really a real literary work because it leaves that space for you and I find those books very exciting I remember at a certain point and again I'm not exactly sure why because I don't always know why I do things it became clear to me that I could only write this novel if I didn't name anybody and indeed there are no places named in it either it, everything is kept very abstract and not particular, even though some of the places, I mean, there's a there's a description of a foreign holiday that they go on together with their child's young. And actually, in my mind, that was Rome because I have been there. But it, it was very important to me not to name it. It's hard to explain why it's to do with, it creates a texture and a tone to the writing that for some reason in this book I wanted. In the same way that when I realised the book started to work, actually, and I can't remember what point this was, when I decided to address the daughter as you, so it became a novel in the second person. That became really important too. I don't know how I, fa- I can't remember how I decided to do that or why, but I just knew when I did it that it worked. And by work, I don't necessarily mean it makes a great book. I mean, I was able to write it. I think this is probably true of a lot of writers. For me, some of the decisions I make, they're made very almost selfishly in the sense that 
if they make me able to write the book, I'll go with them. Doesn't matter what they are, how bizarre. I, I don't think them through and think, hold on, now will readers like this or will this will the book sell if I do this? I never think those things. I just think, right, I can write this. So that's where that came from. And I think that I enjoy that as a reader as well. I want to feel like I'm putting something in to get something back and to yeah. feel that sort of reflection that goes on and that connection between a an author and that connection between the story. I think those are sort of the best works that, like you said, that you can return back to. I know when yeah. I read nonfiction again, I will find details that I did not see the first time or make a connection that I didn't have before. Yeah. But I wonder, is it challenging ever to sort of pare down those details into what only really needs to be there? Because there are so many gaps in this book that I know there has to be some sort of thought about what happened in those in-between times, even though we don't see it on the page. Yes. There has to be more there. So mm -hmm. how does that paring down occur? Well, I don't know. I mean, there is and there isn't. I know what you're saying. It's or is it more of a building up rather than a paring down? I think it down? is true that for me, well, it's, yeah, it's definitely a no, it's more like I was saying, like, you know, you've got this piece of stone and you're chipping bits away. And if the shape that's coming out feels right, then you're chipping away the right bits of stone. And if that's a funny analogy, but it is what I feel. So, because the thing really does already exist. Actually, the other way I, I've occasionally said this before, actually, I think, interviews, but it's also true. When I start a novel, it feels like you're in a darkened room and you can't see anything. And then slowly, as I get through the novel, like the lights are coming on slightly and you can see hazy shapes. And then by the very end of the book, if I'm lucky, you really have got a lit room that you can see. But to me, and this is very important, that room was always there. It doesn't only exist because the lights have come on. It was definitely there before. That's why when I'm writing, I mean, sometimes I can literally feel like my brow becomes completely furrowed because I'm concentrating so hard to see. But I really am looking for something that already exists. It's how I've always written. And so if I leave gaps, or, you know, if I don't describe certain things, partly it will be because I have decided that is boring to describe. So, you know, because I, I, the other thing is I do feel that, again, a, a good a novel you want to read, it takes you straight through and keeps you reading. It doesn't do boring bits or bits of description that you don't need or anything. There should be nothing that's superfluous. And I have an instinct about when those things are superfluous. But also, you know, if you're building the book up properly, if you're if you believe in every little piece that you write, every chunk and paragraph, it won't matter that there aren't things there in between. But can I be questioned about them? Not necessarily, but just about once actually years ago, somebody wanted to make a film of something might happen. I'm saying, because you know that one. And there was talk of us doing, my husband actually, who's a screenwriter, we were going to write the screenplay together, probably mostly him because he's a much better screenwriter than I am. But I remember at the meeting being questioned with them saying, but what really happened after that scene and such and such? And I hadn't got answers because actually I wanted to say to them, in fact, I probably did say to them, no. All I know about these people is here in this book. I don't know anything else. I've written down everything I have to say about them. And so, no, it isn't as if I've got this kind of chart somewhere with all the things that really happened and I've just chosen to only put a few in. The things I put in are all I know. So I just have extent, I'm as much in the dark as the reader. I don't know how that makes me sound, but it's true. No, I think that that sounds very interesting because I am such a, like, list maker and chronicler of things that like in my brain there has to be something but it actually is like well I'll supply that that's fine I can do that yes. you've given me all I've, I, I need already yeah. and I can do the rest and what you've written doesn't have to be real it has to feel real and the feel you know it's a kind of magic trick in a way it has to feel real that's absolutely vital but it, you don't have to be able to explain every single bit of it and you know and I think that's a very important thing for me actually because it's that trick, it's the, it's the magic trick, the building of it and making it feel real is the thing that most excites me about writing. And I think a lot of that comes through in the sort of pieces of this book that are about writing. And the, when this narrator sort of goes on these moments of trying to understand what she writes or why she writes, or there's a part where her daughter is questioning her about writing and, and she's like, I think I might be done. And her daughter's like, that's who you are. And those moments just hit of like, oh, I love anything that sort of delves into, you sort of get an insight, yeah. I guess, into the author's yeah. idea on the craft. Yeah. I mean, it's with the student. Uh, that, that is everything I know about writing. Everything I have put into those little parts, which I really enjoyed writing, by the way, they are everything I feel and know about writing. So, you know, I don't think I have any more to say about writing than is in those parts. It's how I write. I've done very little teaching, but the tiny amount I have done, that's kind of how I've taught. And yet, with the, when the daughter says that, 
it's funny actually because some I can't remember some journalist who was interviewing me said I assume that's a real conversation you've had with your children and I said not at all actually that never happened but I do know it's what they feel or I sense it's what they feel I mean they're not really very interested in my writing but I sense they're not interested but neither do they want you to stop being that person who is their mum who's a writer because that's how I, that's who I am for them I mean I've always written since they were tiny so actually, I have really enjoyed letting myself write about writing because I haven't allowed myself to do that before but even so, I hope I wanted to keep a bit of ambiguity because although she says this about writing, it, even that, I can't remember exactly how, but that gets questioned throughout the novel, actually. I think you could also say it's questioned and questionable. Some of yeah, it. I think it's questioned in sort of how she even returns to it herself. There are moments where she may be not fully believing 100 percent what she's yeah. saying, but. Yeah, I think that's true. You go along with her because you, by this point in the book, I mean, as you move through, you're like, I've I've invested in this person. And I think there are so yeah. many moments, like you said, where you're like, oh, I'm not 100% sure if this event happened exactly as this is being described. Is this part of the writing? Yeah. Is this more? And yet all of it sort of bubbles together and you're like, maybe it doesn't even matter it, and anymore yeah. what is the actual thing because all of it feels authentic yeah I think that's true actually I do feel that about every single novel I've written regardless of subject matter is so I don't know so properly part of who I am that you could say in a way this kind of endless picking apart of things that that actually it's, it's usually journalists not readers like to do of saying but is that true or that could be true and stuff it almost doesn't matter in a way all my novels are true every single book I've ever written is an absolutely accurate reflection of my state of mind at that moment at that time when I wrote Something Might Happen, I was full of anxiety when I wrote Something Might Happen. So, And the title is No Accident. And every time I've written a novel, there's been something like that that has filled me with, I don't know, I've been filled with a feeling. And so all the feelings in all my novels are absolutely true, what I was feeling at the time. And to pick about the actual events is almost beside the point, I sometimes feel. I mean, even I forget what's true and what isn't. But And yet, on, at the same time, they're all largely fiction. So, you know, what do you say? I think also there's sort of this obsession I often see in like reviews of of auto fiction and deciding, you know, is this person writing from their own life and are these experiences? And yeah. yet I think all writing, even if you're writing something vastly different from yourself, yes. you will find pieces of the author in that work. And yes, there are absolutely, absolutely novels that are written by people who are talking about their own life experiences and fictionalizing yes. them. Yeah. And yet I think every work, you will be able to pick out pieces of an author if they've really yeah. put their soul into it. Absolutely. I mean, because I think that's why there's a bit where, sorry, it's a little while since I read the book, but there's a, there's a bit where she tells the student to try putting it into the first person. And the students, just to get that sort of immediacy, and the student's first impulse is to say, but this isn't about me. Don't want you to think that. And then later, the student comes back to her much, much later on. And again, I didn't know I was going to do this, but when I wrote it, it became so much the obvious thing to have. The student has discovered that actually it was much more about her than she ever realised. And to some extent, I'm also saying that's true of this novel, possibly true of me and this novel, but only possibly. And I wanted that all to be there, all that possibility, because at the same time, although I'm saying that nonfiction is a novel and it is, I do think when you write a novel and when you write it in the first person, you can end up finding you've written much more clearly about yourself than you ever thought you were going to. And again, I think that's another of the really exciting things about writing. So I wanted to keep that in there as well. I think she mentions a mother, the student. It, in other words, the student is to some extent reflecting the author of this book, who may or may not be me, but I felt that was really important. <laughs> it's kind of, I love playing with all that. And, I, and indeed, I hope the book sort of is supposed to ask questions about all that stuff that even I don't really know the answer to. I'm more interested in the questions. And I think it goes back to so often, if when you pull back even further, that there is no one way to write about writing. There's no one way to write about motherhood, to write about addiction and its effects on a family. Yeah. We have these Absolutely. wealth of stories that need to be told. And yet I think even if there are connections to a reader's life, to even read about that happening in another way, it all sort of melds together and creates an, a sort of communal experience when you come to a, a really good novel. Yeah. In the same way that talking, that conversations are so necessary to human beings. I mean, books are like that, aren't they? They're a conversation about something that may or may not have been experienced by you, but there'll be something in there, definitely, that speaks to you. And I think especially when we're talking about sort of these heavier topics, and often your books definitely do stray towards the heavier of topics of life, and yet <laughs> they never feel oppressive or too painful. There's always 
sort of these strands of light that go through where you can connect really well to that character. I'm really glad you say that. Yeah, I don't know, because I don't know. I do end up writing about quite dark things. I know I do, but I do feel very strongly. First of all, I'm not. Well, I am and I'm not, but I, people sometimes say to me, you're so different from your books. You, you're much kind of funnier and kind of not, not like your books. But I, and I, that's nice, good, I hope so. But also, you know, I, at the end of the day, and I know this to be true, it's from my very first novel, I've always really been writing about love. All my books are about love, because although I'm fascinated by loss, and I often write about loss, you know, loss is nothing without love. There is, it doesn't exist without love. And it's what you stand to lose by being a human being and loving your children or your husband or whoever. That's what I'm really interested in. And it's a very basic thing. I mean, I'm not the first person to write about it, obviously, but it is the thing that really obsesses me. And I would love to feel that people end my books not thinking, oh, that was a dark read, but thinking, yes, that's about love. I can relate to that because it's moving, because it's about love. That's what I really want. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it, it's what I want people to feel. I think that that is a, a very prevalent theme in this book, that sense of love. You feel it on the page so often, even when it is the most painful of things, because it often is in our lives, right? There are these moments where the love that the narrator has for her child, for her husband, for her mother, it's all, you know, right there at the forefront yeah. that sort of guides us through some of these heavier moments. And, I think, and also, I think but when you, this is another thing I'm interested in and always happy, when you become a parent, you become absolutely powerless in a sense, in a, in a terrible sense. And I suppose the really terrible thing about addiction, although f thankfully it's only, ex I worried that actually writing about addiction might be boring because unless you've experienced it, it's not very interesting in a way that the small club or thankfully fairly small club of parents who've experienced that, most people haven't. Nothing emphasizes or illustrates that powerlessness as much as having an addict for a child or an addiction in the family. It is the worst kind of powerless because it, you can't do the things that you might do. Again, I think I say this in the book, you know, if someone's ill, even seriously ill, and that's a tragedy and it's very frightening, but there are there's certain steps you can take to make them more comfortable or to help or to find help. With addiction, you really are the only way is to step away. And that is not, that's the last thing any parent wants to do with their child. It's the most painful thing possible. So I wanted to write about that too. And I think, so when I write about loss, which I often do, and love, I think that powerlessness is one of the worst aspects of love, actually, in a way, or the most, the hardest to experience, definitely. And I wonder, I mean, we've touched on this a little bit that, you know, even though there are more personal elements of you and your life and your sort of views in this, does it feel different to sort of publish this than some of your novels in the past, especially since it's been a little bit of a larger gap between your yeah. Your last novel in this. Yeah, it is it is different. And I think the book I'm writing now is is different in the same way. Although it's not like nonfiction, but it's more it's still different from my other books. I think what was different about it, and it's partly why it took me so long. And indeed, when I finished it, I didn't think it was any good. You, you probably ought to know that. I I didn't think it was going to work, even when I'd finished it. But I was it was amazing that people like it. You know, in my other books, I do tend to write a plot. I do as I go along, I find a plot. I don't I don't start at the beginning with a plot ever. But even with something might happen, I could tell that this was going to happen and that was going to happen and that was going to trigger that. And certainly in my last novel, The Stopped Heart, which is a sort of double ghost story, there's two ghost stories wrapped around each other. That is quite plotty. And this was the first time I'd sort of dared, I don't know, it's hard to say what to call it, like relaxing the bits, the bits where the plot would go. I just kind of dared to put almost nothing there and see, see how it all linked up. And because it's got an emotional plot, as it were, but I didn't want to have a sort of physical, and it's very hard for me because I've written quite a few books with sort of plots. It's hard to resist that. A part of you wants to organise it in such a way that the reader will be in suspense. Because I also like, I love the suspense of a sort of ghost story or a psychological story. And so I resisted that every time and began to feel that because of that, it wasn't working. But clearly in the end, it did, I think. But yes, it did feel different to write. Harder, much harder. <laughs> I think a lot of the suspense that I found or like that tension comes, I think, from the way that you use time in this, that you we are not yeah. in a linear sort of path through this novel. You bounce back and forth and you make the reader sort of make the timeline in their head versus saying, yeah, that's true. You know, yeah. this is how this happened and in this order or even bouncing back and saying, OK, this many years ago or this time. But you leave us clues with ages and things like that to sort of put pieces together. But I think that's sort of how I found a lot of that tension was 
never knowing what sort of that next paragraph break was going to bring and where we yes. would be and when we would be. No, that's true. And I think I also, the other thing that um, there is a bit where the narrator and her husband, she, well, the narrator says she looks back and realizes when they try to think back on what happened when, they lose all sense of chronology because actually that also, addiction does that to you. And also to some extent, we all do that, don't we? We, we, we can't believe that that only happened last year, but that thing happened eight years ago. I'm always amazed at how things happened much further away than I thought they did or much longer ago. So, and chrono so again, a chronology, we only have each other's word for it in a way, don't we? And I think the human brain deals very strangely with chronology, actually. It's even for me, the last 10, 20 years, I'm not sure I can put them in order. But it's something everyone experienced with the pandemic, actually, didn't they? That yeah. you seem to lose a few years. But I think the other thing to say about time is I find time a very, very moving thing, actually. And I suppose it's about mortality, isn't it? But the passing of time, the fact that things change and you get older and that our time together, all of us, is finite. That's something that, again, I think about a lot and it moves me and I've tried to write about it. I've touched on that in a lot of my novels, actually. In various different ways, because I suppose mainly because it's sort of the most blistering part of the human experience in a weird way. The fact that time we get older and you can't believe that you're ever going to get older when you're a certain age, can you? And then you do. Well, you're still young, but you'll find that you do. <laughs> oh, I'm starting it's to amazing. find it. <laughs> I think especially post, I mean, COVID, I think everyone now, so many people I talk to, it's just like time is different now. We'll never think of time the same way as we did before yeah, it's that. It's very weird. It's the weirdest thing. It's it's very good that we've all experienced it. But you no, know, someone was saying to me the other day, I, oh, this happened. And I can't remember if it was before or after COVID and, or before and after lockdown. And I thought, it's true. You don't, we don't remember wh when things were. Something happened to everybody's grasp of time. Yeah. And I think that that's something that we'll sort of see. I can't wait to sort of see that being played with in in literature and in art. That like yeah. those times when we really start to see what's going to come out of all that time. So many people, you know, they're like, "This is my COVID novel or my lockdown novel or all those yeah. things." And I think it's we'll too sort of soon. See. I think. Yeah. Yes, I think it'd be interesting to know actually whether it, whether it changes things for some writers or whether it just end up being a blip. I have no interest in writing about it, but that doesn't mean I never will. But somehow it's not. It's, it's too it's too bizarre a thing in a funny kind of way. It almost yeah, see, yeah. feels like one of those like stranger than fiction, like we lived something yes. more odd than we could ever fully grasp in art. Yeah, it's, it's interesting actually what you can and can't write about in fiction because I have to be able to feel be feeling quite cool about it in the sense that it's either happened a long time ago or I don't have any particular passion in that moment about it. And then I find I can find the passion in the writing. But I couldn't, if something terrible happened to me today, I couldn't write about it tomorrow, for instance. Not like that. Some people can. Some people, in a, even in a diary sort of way, can. I couldn't do that. And that's why this novel has taken six years to appear. I have yes, to ask, though, too. one of my questions as I was reading this, how you settled on nonfiction as a title. Just seeing nonfiction, a novel, is like, you know, a bit of a visual gag in itself. So I just wonder how you settled on nonfiction the title well, it's really funny I didn't have a title for the book and I must have been about at least halfway through it and I mean it's a very it's a very banal reason actually I but, but I think this is actually this is interesting about writing when I'm writing a novel once I'm writing one like I am at the moment writing a novel it always feels to me like there's this great big trawling net in front of you so even when you're not if you're off duty doing something completely unrelated to writing or work if something gets catches caught in that net that seems to relate to your book you will keep it always so in other words in some ways, if I walk down the street, everything, even though I'm not thinking about the novel, everything that relates to it will find its way to me. And I was, I didn't have a title and I was sitting reading the Sunday papers. I think I was in bed actually and reading the book section. And it just said nonfiction on the, I think nonfiction and then the reviews underneath it. And I just turned to my husband and said, has it ever called a novel nonfiction? And he said, no, I don't think so. And I said, that's my title. It was actually my agent who came up with the idea of calling it nonfiction a novel. Because it is actually very confusing for booksellers, isn't it? I mean, it's not, it's a very confusing thing to do. And I still think if you Google it, it's not ideal. So it does actually bring a whole lot of problems with itself. But it, to me, it just was so obvious that it was the right title. And I was already writing a book that clearly was called nonfiction. I just didn't know it. But it, it's a very, it's a very, very banal reason. I just literally saw the word there and knew it. She, you know, something might happen. The title from that, I didn't have a title. And I was reviewing, I did a bit of reviewing films in the cinema. And I was in a film screening of a not very good film, and I can't even remember what it was called. And a girl, which I probably wrote a not very good review of, <laughs> and a girl said to a boy at a bar, yeah, we can't do that because something might happen. And in there in the dark, I wrote it down thinking, that's my title. <laughs> so 
So, you know, it was exactly the right title. And that's what I mean by having you got these antennae out that are sort of just, even though you don't know it, they're searching for things to do with the novel. It's actually, that's a very exciting way to be. I do think once I'm in the middle of a novel that takes, normally they take me a couple of years, really, of writing, you are in a different place. It's a very interesting place to be. You're normal in some ways with the people who you love and see and everything. There's another part of you that's having a whole different experience off somewhere else. <laughs> I love that. And that kind of leads me into sort of my favorite part of all of these interviews is asking you your literary influences, who are the sort of people that either have, whether it's for this book or in general, sort of put an influence. I know that one of the reasons that I was so excited when I got my copy here is that there's a blurb from Sarah Beautiful. Waters, who is, oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, if she's... Sarah Waters blurbs anything, I will immediately pick it yes. up. But I wonder sort of who are yeah. your influences? No, Sarah Waters and Rachel Cusk have both quoted for the book, and I do know them both, actually, but their writing means a lot to me, both of them. They've done things that are sort of very much what I'm interested in. But you know, it's very difficult when someone asks that. The truth is, it's whoever I'm... So at the moment, I'm, sorry, I'm just looking at my desk. I mean, the most exciting writer I've read recently in a while is, um, but I've only read one book of hers, and I've got the whole pile there, is Joanne Beard, um, a book called Cherie. So fantastic. So that's very... It's not exactly influencing me, but I have to... When I'm writing a novel, I have to read very clean prose, prose that sort of leaves those gaps and excites me. So I love, her work is fantastic, and I'm about to read some more. I loved a writer called Domenico Starnoni, who's translated by Jhumpa Lahiri. Have you read him? Yeah. Fantastic. I've read almost, I think I've got one more, Trust, yeah, and Trick and Ties. Now those, I've been reading those at the moment, and they're sort of, again, it's not so much that they're influencing me, but they, they're what I need in my head at the moment. They've got that cleanness. But I mean, God, so many writers have influenced me in so many different ways. I used to I remember in the early days when I was first writing, Peter Carey had a huge, he wrote a book called The Tax Inspector that I just thought was a bit of a writer's book, but fantastic. But I think it's true it, for each book. When I was writing nonfiction, I can't remember who I was reading. Sometimes I can't read anyone at all because like, the voice that's in my head is so strong, I can't really, some, some writers have this and some don't. I get, I'm like that. I could read something that was entirely different, but I can't read these writers. Yeah, it depends. I mean, I think that it all makes a lot of sense. I always want to know. It is very interesting to hear when writers can and can't. Like, I mean, I've heard people say, I can't even listen to music with lyrics. I can't, you know, I, I, the only I voice in my that. head no. has to be my own. And I yes. think it's very interesting to sort of hear how I those... need silence to write. I need silence in a blank wall. My husband could do it with the cricket commentary on and music <laughs> with lyrics. I mean, I cannot imagine it. I've just, another book I read recently that I loved is The Guest by Emma Klein. Yes. You read that? Yeah. Oh, that was fantastic. Now that, I'd be very proud to have written that book. I think it's a perfect piece of writing. So controlled, so original, so and yet so apparently effortless and ordinary. And it isn't. It's brilliant. There isn't a writer on the planet, I don't think, who doesn't find reading really important. And I read all the time. And I'm, I'm really, I'm never happier than reading something new, you know, that I haven't really heard of before. That's what I try to do. So yeah, there's some lovely, so many young writers coming up who are brilliant, like Emma Klein and well, younger than me anyway. <laughs> so my <laughs> last question is sometimes author's favorite, sometimes their least favorite, but I always want to know. Um, and you've hinted, obviously, that you're writing something, uh, writing a novel now, yeah. but I just always ask, what's next? What can we What can we look forward oh, to? It's funny. I, I never, ever, ever tell anyone, not my husband, not my agent, not nobody about the thing I'm writing. Um, it's completely secret and private unto myself. And it, for some reason it has to be. And I think it's because... I was talking to a novelist about this the other day, actually, who was showing his work, his half-finished novel, to his agent and a friend. I thought, can you do that? Because to me, it doesn't exist in any way that I can really believe in until it's completely finished. And even then, it has to have absolutely convinced me. Then I will hand it over. And then, OK, if someone doesn't like it, I'm ready. You know, I can deal with that. But I couldn't. So, yeah, it's an, all I can say is it's a novel. Um, it's different from all my other novels and quite different from nonfiction too, I think. But then probably people will read it and say it's the same old stuff. <laughs> so I don't know. For me, it feels exciting and different. Because he's doing a couple of things that I've never done before, actually. So I will gladly wait. I I'll read anything you put out. So it will I will be patient oh, very kind. and wait. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know that in the meantime, since there's plenty of time before your new novel, you have an incredible backlist that all of our listeners can go through. But most importantly, I would love for them to pick up nonfiction because I think it is something truly something special. So oh, thank, thank you so, you so much, much for joining us today. It means a lot today. to hear that, actually. She fills me with confidence for my writing tomorrow. So thank you. Thank you so much. 
That was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.